we've now started playing with linear regression and we've already run into something that looks a lot like overfitting. And in particular, this happened with our brain machine interface data. So I'd like to spend a, a couple of videos talking about where this overfitting problem comes from and uh, how we might be able to resolve it. What I mean by overfitting are, are really scenarios where we've drawn data from a distribution. Uh, we've drawn, in particular, two different data sets from that distribution uh, independently. We have fit a model using one data set, and then we go to apply that model to make predictions about the other data set. And the relative performance of these uh, two different situations is quite different from one another. So we perform very well with respect to the training data, but we do not perform well on the independent data. And really what's going on here is that the model that we've learned really hasn't captured the general trends in the, uh, the full distribution of the data, but it's really captured the, the specifics of that particular training set that we've worked with. And we really want to be able to, to, to capture the, the larger trends. We've already talked about how we can detect the situation, and that's by comparing model performance with uh, these two different data sets. Overfitting can come from a variety of different places, or at least apparent overfitting. So one issue that we run across with the brain machine interface data is that of a very small training set uh, relative to the complexity of the model that we're trying to construct. So one of the clues is, is if we end up in a situation where we have uh, the number of samples in our training set being something on the order of the number of model parameters. And, the, and that's very much the situation that we have with our brain machine interface examples. And even if the number of parameters is a few factors uh, larger than the number of uh, model parameters, we can still run into trouble unless we take uh, very specific steps. Another situation that can come up is, is when the training set samples are not really drawn independently from one another. So this might happen uh, in situations where we're drawing data uh, from a, a time series of, of some form and we're drawing uh, samples consecutively. And, and so one sample that we draw and the next one, there might be some statistical relationships be, between those. Uh, and, and what that means is that we're not really covering the full dimensionality of the, the variation uh, of, the, of the data set. In this situation, we're really artificially reducing the, the size of the training set, at least effectively. Another situation that can come up that's really more about apparent overfitting is when we have data that we draw for training that is really coming from a different distribution as for the, the testing purposes. So, so this can happen, say, uh, if we're trying to make predictions about the housing market, are, are certain houses going to go up in value versus down? The issue is that the training data that we have is, might cover all the time up to this point in time, uh, but we want to be able to make predictions about what's happening in the future. And the reality is that lots of fundamental things uh, change in the housing market uh, that can affect value that just are not at all reflected in uh, what's happened in the past. So if we were to have a major earthquake, for example, that dramatically changes value as, as we move forward. Okay, so let, let's uh, do a little bit of drawing here to get a bit more intuition, and then we'll move on to a bit of math. Right, we've, we've already done an example where we have say a, uh, a data set that looks uh, something along these lines here. And if I were to fit a, a line uh, to this data set, uh, we're not really gonna have anything that shows up. It's very interesting. Maybe, maybe it might look like this. So that's not terribly predictive. If I try to fit a quadratic uh, to, the, uh, to this data set, I might actually get the, the general trend that I'm really uh, interested in. But we could, of course, move on uh, to higher and higher order polynomials here. And uh, if we went a little bit crazy with that, we might end up with uh, a polynomial that looks something like, uh, let's see, let's see, 
let's do something like this. So in that particular case, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, nine lumps there, so to speak. Um, so, that, so we have at least a, a nine degree polynomial. And, uh, and we have a total of, we have a total of 12 training points here. So, so really the, the number of degrees of freedom that we have with our polynomial is something approximating the number of training samples that we have as compared to our quadratic, the red curve, which only has three parameters. So, so we, on, on the surface level, just looking at those numbers, the, the quadratic feels perhaps uh, like we're doing, we would do better fitting a, a model of that form rather than the nine degree polynomial. So in this particular case, uh, we, our, our blue model here does quite well with uh, dealing, dealing with some of our samples. So if I were to say, give me an X and what is the corresponding Y? Well, I, I end up with say a sample uh, on the blue curve, which is right there. And, and so the difference between the, the training point that's nearby just the, above that and this point that we're predicting is not all that big. But if I were to, if I were to say, play in the query an X at this point, then my prediction would be up at the very top here. And, and the distance between sort of eyeballing it uh, between this point here and uh, say where that red curve is, which might be more correct, that's a fairly large uh, difference here. And, and in particular, if I were to, uh, to provide a set of uh, validation samples that I could use, I could, I could measure uh, the, the quality of uh, the blue curve relative to say the red curve and perhaps make some better decisions about whether to stick with the three degree of freedom polynomial versus the nine degree of freedom. So this is one scenario where we're using a model that's too complex there are going to be ways where we can add some additional constraints that help us rein in uh, this overfitting, uh, even if we're trying to use a nine degree polynomial. So we'll talk about that. But I wanted to give you one little bit more of uh, intuition here. And this is a very common scenario and, and it really is probably what's happening within our brain machine interface data. So imagine a, a situation where I have so one of our channels of input, let's call it XI. So the distribution of, of points for this, for this particular feature might look something al along these lines where uh, we have zero likelihood here and, and really some interesting uh, non-zero likelihood up above. So what, what this means is that if I were to take a bunch of samples in this, in this, uh, of, of this feature, I would tend to see lots in, in this vicinity here, and there'll be occasionally some that sit out at the tail, but the vast majority will sit out in, in this uh, area here. Likewise, the value that we're trying to predict, so this is some, some y, and uh, say some dimension of y, and uh, it also has a statistical behavior. So I'm gonna draw a distribution on its side here. So again, I'm going to assume it's something along the lines of a, of a Gaussian. And, and what I mean by this is that we're, we're going to tend to have lots of samples in the middle here, and, and then the density is going to drop off. And by the time we get out into the tail, um, that density is going to be very low. So with a Gaussian distribution, the likelihood is actually non-zero as we go out to, uh, to the limit of, or go out arbitrarily far, either in the positive direction or the, or the uh, negative direction. So imagine now that we have a scenario where this xi and yk are independent of one another. And, and so what that means is that if I, we, we can think of this as uh, a, drawing independent samples of, of these two different variables 
and, and let's build a scatter plot of, of what that might look like. And uh, so sometimes uh, Xi, we have a high density down the middle here, so I might end up with uh, a, value, uh, a value here. And um, on the yk, I might end up with a value right here. So, so if I plot both of those together, I, I now have a point at this location here. And with these two distributions and them being independent of one another, uh, um, what that means, by them being independent, I mean that uh, once I select xi, it doesn't change what, what the distribution of yk might be. So, so the, the uh, joint distribution between these two variables is going to be a two-dimensional Gaussian, which, uh, which has uh, a shape that looks something along these lines. So a lot of density in the in the middle here, where middle, I, I mean uh, middle of x and the middle of y, and then as we as we get away from the middle of either one of those, then the density starts to go down. So occasionally, so you could imagine having a, a sample uh, up here, you could imagine having a, a sample out here, but those are going to be uh, exceedingly rare kinds of things. So the, the vertical axis here is, is longer than the horizontal axis, and, and that just comes from the, the way I've drawn the, the two individual uh, distributions for, for y and x, respectively. So the, the reality is, um, when we're actually drawing a training set, is, is that I might not have uh, a sample that looks so nice and uniform as what we have here. Uh, if I draw a much smaller training set, so let's go ahead and do that in, in green here. Let's see if I can, well, sorry, I'm gonna go ahead and erase um, this nice uniform sample here. If I imagine just sampling randomly a, a small set of those points, I might, I'm still going to end up on average with that same uh, distribution, but I might end up with something along uh, these lines here. And, and sort of eyeballing it, it kind of looks like the, what we had before. Um, except the number of points is much smaller. Now, if I ask, if I say I'm, I want to now uh, build a linear model here that takes us from xi to yk, what the least mean squared algorithm is going to do is try its hardest to capture the, the trend of this particular set of points. And eyeballing this, that trend looks something along the, these lines here. And hopefully you'll agree that that, that black line actually captures the, the trend reasonably well there. So, so this is all, all well and good. The, we've minimized the, the mean squared error uh, of, uh, of this particular training set. But, but now imagine what happens Let's try taking a few more samples. So now in the future, I'm drawing a new set of XIs and I want to make predictions about what YK would be. And, and in general, this is going to perhaps do an okay job. So if I, if I query right here, then my model is going to, uh, to say this is the value here. And, and that's, a, that's a reasonable uh, answer. But Staring at this distribution that we drew down below, notice that we do have this very small density of points sitting out at this tail. And suppose I happen to get one of those. So what happens if I get this point? So I, I have a query now here, and, and so now I'm left with asking the question of, uh, where does this red curve uh, intersect my model? And, and the answer is, quite a ways up, up the page. And, and so the implication here is that we're going to make a very large prediction for what yk ought to be. So in our brain machine interface data that we were playing with, sometimes we were kind of capturing the, 
the essence of the curve and occasionally we were making very wild uh, predictions for, uh, for some of the positions. And, and this is the type of uh, situation that's happening here. Now, if I had not just this very small number of green samples, but instead a, a much larger training set and, and then tried to fit a, a model to that, what I'm probably ending up with is something more along the lines of, uh, of this. So I'll have, give it a tiny bit of slope here. And if I had an infinite number of uh, training samples, uh, and, and these two variables were indeed independent of one another, then really that slope uh, that describes their relationship should really be zero. So, so what we have is this really large disconnect between what the ideal model is for this particular pair of variables. So that's, that's the, the purple curve or maybe even a flatter curve and, and this black curve. And, and because the slope is so high for the, for the black curve, then the occasional times where, where our XI sample kind of steps into the tail, we're going to make really wild predictions for YK. But intuitively, it really shouldn't matter what XI is, uh, why we should be making the same uh, predictions for what YK should be. So what this hints at is, is this idea that um, maybe what we should do is uh, try to keep our models from uh, having these really high slopes. And, and in particular, where we're going to go with this is that we want to choose uh, very low slopes, maybe even a slope of zero, unless the data really calls for there being a true relationship between the two variables. So that's what we're going to do next uh, in the mathematics.